what is going on in the city of Johannesburg. We've had like five mayors in two weeks. Apparently we had an old apartheid person now investigating ESCOM. ESCOM is now doing an investigation into an investigation. When is load shedding going to end? Spread the fire. Welcome back to SMWX. Thank you so much for the positive response to our recent analysis video, which has got over 120,000 views. In that video, a lot of you commented and said you're really liking the analysis. It doesn't always have to be about interviewing guests, which we will continue to do. But I thought I'd provide you with some more of my own thoughts and insights on, well, insights to the extent that they are insightful, on South African politics right now. and. I want to experiment with not just looking at one topic, but actually talking about three different topics. So comment down below if you enjoy this format and we'll continue to do more of it. So I want to talk about three things in this video. The first thing is just the constant rolling blackouts, load shedding, the situation with ESCOM, Andre Dereta corruption, that whole set of questions, which we've been focusing on on this channel. Then I want to speak about an interesting question, the question of, Makadzi, the superstar recording artist who's been in a dispute and a spat with her record label. And then finally, I want to talk about Joburg coalition politics. Let's try and understand these three interesting issues. So let's get started in terms of the question of ESCOM. I'm quite interested in the way the story is unfolding because you'll recall that the ESCOM CEO, former CEO Andre Dureta, came out in an interview with Annika Larson. Shout out to Annika Larson for that interview, where he made these very serious allegations about corruption, saying that there were two senior ministers involved in effectively cartels that were milking ESCOM. And of course, this was a serious allegation and everyone, because of our history with corruption and state capture in South Africa, was like, okay, who are the ministers? Tell us about the situation. But the story has become more complicated. So senior investigative journalist um, Jacques Poe, who's written a lot of books, most noteworthy, The President's Keepers, which sold a whole lot of copies, which was about the Zuma years, said that he was writing a book with um, the ESCOM COO, I think it is, um, Oberholzer is his surname. And they were going to do a kind of expose book together about ESCOM. So Jacques Poe would be the journalist, the Oberholzer guy would be the internal ESCOM person. But as Jacques Poe, according to an interview he did, as well as some reporting in News 24, as Jacques Poe went deeper into this, he says that he found that Dereta's allegations were based on a private intelligence report. So basically, Dereta went behind a lot of backs and got a private firm to do intelligence on ESCOM, where he was CEO. Now, he says he did this, or it seems he did this, because he was frustrated with how slow law enforcement was in terms of investigating corruption. But there's an even deeper problem because apparently this private investigative firm that was looking into this corruption on which Dereta founded his claims, apparently this was run by some former apartheid spy or security agent uh, by the name of Tony Oesthuizen, according to Poe. So in democratic South Africa, we had an ESCOM CEO enlisting a former apartheid securocrat type person who Bo uh, says has been implicated in like assassinations and the Bureau of State Security, Google those evil and terrible chapters in South African history. Apparently we had an old apartheid person now investigating ESCOM and Andre Dereta making claims based on this investigation. Now this raises a whole host of concerns. Firstly, the privatization of intelligence. 
You see, part of the problem with the, the breakdown of the state is that the first option is privatize everything, privatize ESCOM, privatize water, privatize intelligence, private security. And yes, it's, it, it puts a band-aid on the problem, but it creates a deeper problem because it means that these private entities that are doing all these important tasks are no longer accountable to citizens. They are accountable to their shareholders, if they have any, or they're just accountable to themselves. And it's very hard to get transparency over these private entities. So when a private entity starts doing intelligence gathering in a public utility, you know something has gone deeply wrong. And then when there are apartheid situations mixed in there, it just gets like very, very scary and 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 just weird. So, I mean, Dorita hasn't gone on record yet about this, but I would definitely want to know if this was what all that was based on and what did he do to fact check these reports and what's the veracity of these reports? What was the process followed? We'll probably never know precisely because they were private. But it just shows this deeper problem of privatizing things just gets you into a whole lot of other problems. The true solution is to actually fix the public and to rehabilitate the public, difficult and, and important as, as that might be. Fixing law enforcement in South Africa, though? Good luck. So we have all this situation, and then we have a situation in Parliament unfolding where the chair of ESCOM, Mpo Magwana, goes before what's called the Standing Committee on Public Accounts. Now, why is this committee important? This is the committee that oversees the money in Parliament. It's a very important and quite a powerful committee. And ESCOM came to the committee because that committee was like, hold on, tell us what's happening with the money of ESCOM. Is there really this corruption? Is there not? Now, the chairperson of ESCOM, Paul Maguana, goes to the committee and he says, you know what? The rater basically didn't tell us anything new and we don't have access to these reports. So actually, when he did that interview, he brought ESCOM into disrepute. It was bad PR, basically. And we effectively decided to fire him. Well, technically, he had resigned and they brought his resignation earlier. But they were like, listen, after that interview, if you're going to be saying stuff like that about ESCOM, then why don't you just go now? But then the committee, in some interesting questions, was like, OK, but you told him to go. But did you ask what was in the report? Like, did you at least ask him to give you the report so you could see it? And they were like, no, we don't think he would have given it to us. So we actually never really asked for it because he wasn't giving it to us anyway, so we didn't ask for it. But we're doing our own investigation. So let me get this straight. ESCOM is now doing an investigation into an investigation. And the South African public hasn't seen either of those investigations. What, what is going on in, in ESCOM, people? And here's the bottom line, right? Load shedding continues to get worse and worse. Corruption Transparency matters because it takes away money from ESCOM so that ESCOM can't do work in power plants, it can't fix things, and therefore the less money ESCOM has, the more load shedding we have, basically. And that's the relationship with corruption. Let me ask you a question. When is load shedding going to end? No one can give us that answer as South African citizens. And I'm actually getting quite tired of the way people are dodging, right? Because about a month ago, the chair of ESCOM, Paul Maguana, did an interview and he was asked this question by reporter uh, or, or interviewer Pauline Gambi on Newsroom Africa. And they asked him, when is it going to end? And you know what he said? We can't say now, we can't tell you because we need to get a CEO first and then there's going to be a minister of electricity and then when we appoint the minister, then we'll be able to tell you. Okay, we still don't have a CEO of ESCOM. Cool. So they deferred the answer. Then the Minister of Electricity was appointed and he was asked, when is load shedding going to end? And guess what he said? Well, I've only been in the job for like a few weeks. Just let me get my bearings. I have to first go to cabinet and then consult with the board of ESCOM. Then I'll tell you. So the minister can't tell us when and he still hasn't told us when it's going to happen. The, the chairperson of the board hasn't told us. The acting CEO of ESCOM hasn't told us. I mean, it's one thing to endure load shedding, but the problem I have is just not knowing when it's going to end. Here's a scary thought. What if no one knows when it's going to end? 
And that's why they can't tell us when it's going to end, because they actually don't know when it's going to end. And this is a question we need an answer to, and we need an answer to fast. And I'm hoping various journalists and others, MPs, parliamentarians, we need this answer now, because it can't be this shell game of like, I can't tell you because this person needs to tell you, but then you ask that person and they're like, no, someone else needs to tell you. We need a date and we need to hold people accountable because if you don't have specific promises, then you can never be held accountable because then you say, well, I didn't tell you it was going to end next year, so I didn't fail. And that's how we are in the situation all these years later. So that's the ESCOM situation. Let's move on to topic number two. Makadzi, who I actually interviewed recently on the SABC, she came through to Unfiltered, and it was a really interesting interview, and I had to do a lot of research, and I just want to unpack some of the things that that came across that I learned in that process. So Makadzi is like this award-winning megastar artist, and she was in a dispute with her record company, and basically she came onto Twitter and said, I don't know what to do, like I've got this dispute, I'm just going to make it public. And it really showed how artists, especially musicians, can be exploited in the entertainment industry. And I think that's something we need to talk about because it's not just about entertainment, it's also about the politics and the economy of South Africa. So the first thing was just about contracts. So she said, number one, her contract was effectively hidden from her, she alleges. So I'm not sure if she signed it or not, because that wasn't clear from her tweets. But let's assume she did sign it. Once she signed it, she wasn't given a copy of the contract so that she could go back and consult it. I mean, that's just crazy. Like if you're ever in that situation, like you need to be able to see your own contract, right? That's kind of important. So it's a red flag if someone's keeping a contract from you, right? But she also said there was this interesting clause of auto renewal. So her contract with her record company apparently had a clause where it would auto renew. And I, I spoke to a, an entertainment lawyer on Unfiltered and I asked him, is there such a thing as an auto renew clause in a contract? Actually, it turns out there is. So you can auto renew a contract, but the catch is that both parties to the contract have to consent to the auto renewal. So it's like you don't have to write a whole new contract if you want to extend your relationship, but you should both agree that the contract is going to be renewed. Now, if one party says, I don't want to renew, then you can't just unilaterally soma say, well, we're renewing anyway, because we're auto renewing. So the label seems to, like Makadzi said, she didn't want to renew, but then the label was like, no, we are just auto renewing because the contract says we'll auto renew. So that's another red flag, I guess, to look out for as anyone who's an artist in the entertainment industry, like contracts are based on consensus. They're based on an agreement between parties. So if you don't agree with something, you shouldn't feel like you have to sign it. And if someone tries to extend a contract without your volition, then you should raise a red flag. And obviously you should be able to see your contract once once you have it. So I think the Makadzi thing is interesting also just because it goes to like a deeper question about the exploitation of artists. So artists and people in the creative industry often aren't thought of as workers. And then the protections that fall under labor laws don't apply to them because they aren't seen as workers. So if you're a worker, you get certain protections. But if you're not a worker, if you're not defined as a worker, as often creative people aren't, then you don't get those protections. And the thing about the creative industry in general is that on the one hand, the amazing things you see, Netflix documentaries, movies, music, all of that is one side of it, but the hidden side is the business side of it. And creatives often spend a lot of time focusing on the creative side to the detriment of the business side. And I guess it's just about thinking of the business side as another creative thing that you have to figure out and master. So thought, those are some thoughts on the Makadzi issue and the general exploitation of musicians and artists in South Africa. Your thoughts, comment down below. So, and check out the, the interview with, with Makadzi as well.
Finally, let's come on to the question of Johannesburg's coalition politics. My, 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 what is going on in the city of Johannesburg? Joburg, the city of instability. Yay, what's going on in the city? We've had like five mayors in two weeks. Al Jama, the political party, has three seats in the Joburg Council and they've had two mayors. That, those are some good, good numbers for, for a party. Let's try and break all of this down. I know it's, it's happening really fast, but let me see if I can help you understand what's going on in Joburg. If you live in Joburg, but even if you live outside Joburg, this is one of the most unpredictable cities in South African politics right now. So you will have heard that Joburg has a new mayor. Hopefully by this time this video has been released, it doesn't have another new mayor. But the current mayor of Joburg is Kabelo Kwamanda. He's from the Al Jama party. And as I say, the Al Jama party has three seats. The previous mayor, who recently resigned, Tapelo Ahmad, was also from the same party. And before him, there was Mpo Palazze from the DA. So let, let's see, how did it happen that, and before her, there was an ANC mayor, and before the ANC mayor, Mpo Palazze was also the mayor. So there have been it was Mpo Palazze, ANC mayor, Mpo Palazze, Tapelo Ahmad, and now Gabelo Guamanda. How did all this happen? The Joburg Council is divided in the following way. There's one block, which is basically the ANC and the EFF. So if you put their numbers together, they have roughly a similar number of votes. Then there's another block, which is the DA, Action SA, the IFP, the ACDP, and the Freedom Front Plus. And if you put their numbers together, they roughly have similar numbers, right? So the Joburg Council is evenly poised. Then you have the Patriotic Alliance, Gayton McKenzie's party. And they basically hold the balance of power. So if they go with the one block, then that block will have a majority. <clears throat> but if they go with another block, then that block will have a majority. So they kind of swing between these two blocks. Now, the Patriotic Alliance started off supporting the DA bloc. So Mpo Paladze became the mayor after the 2021 election. The Patriotic Alliance, Action SA, Freedom Front, IFP, all of those parties got together and they formed, um, they formed a government in Joburg. But then over time, the Patriotic Alliance started being swayed by the ANC. They claim that the DA was arrogant and all of that. And to cut a long story short, they shifted across to the ANC and EFF. So those uh, parties came together and they voted in the ANC mayor. But then that ANC mayor was voted out. And Paul Palazze managed to get a, a cobble together a, a, a big enough voting bloc and she came back in. And then once again was voted out. So as you can see, the PA keeps shifting, and when the PA shifts, the balance of power shifts and a new party comes in. But the interesting thing recently is that because the ANC and the EFF don't necessarily see eye to eye, they can't agree on one person from their party becoming the mayor now. So what they've done is they've said instead of an ANC mayor or an EFF mayor in Joburg, they're going to elect someone from a minority party that they both support and whose support they enjoy. And that person will be the mayor as a kind of compromise between the two. And that's how we've got these part, uh, candidates from minority parties being catapulted to the level of mayor. And Al Jama is one of the smaller parties that has sided with the EFF ANC bloc, as it were. So they've kind of put Al Jama into the mayorship as a compromise between the two because they, they can't see eye to eye on either one of them. And a similar thing has happened in places like Ekuruleni, where the current mayor is from a very small party called the AIC, not the ANC, um, Sivuile Ngodwana. Ideally, the EFF wants to run Ekuruleni and have a mayor 
and they will then allow the ANC to run Joburg and have the mayor. But because they can't agree, they've said in both places they're actually going to have these minority compromise candidates. Now, on the one hand, that's been seen as anti-democratic because ideally you would have a mayor who enjoys the party support of a majority of the residents. But there's nothing constant unconstitutional about it. Anyone in a council can become the mayor. It's in some ways a dangerous political move because then both the ANC and the EFF, when this instability occurs in Joburg, both get blamed for putting up these mayors who actually don't enjoy wide public support. And we saw with Mayor Ahmad, who I actually thought was given a bit of a raw deal in the South African media, I happen to know him, so um, yeah, I think I think there's more to him than than um, than came across in some of his controversial interviews. But part of the reason why there was such a backlash against it is because these parties don't enjoy wide public support. And as a mayor, what you trade in is political capital. So if you don't have a lot of political capital and you rely on other parties for their capital then it's easy to become isolated in the media. So I think that's one of the dangers of the strategy. But effectively, to cut a long story short and really to just try and get your head around it, that's what's happening in Joburg right now. Is this a sign of things to come in 2024? I think what's interesting for me is that the opposition coalition led by the DA, it's been outmaneuvered to be quite honest. and. Those who think that an opposition coalition is going to be swift and easy after 2024 might have another thing coming because I think I've been shocked by the fact that these opposition parties, including the PA, actually can't coalesce and are actually prepared to give up power back to the ANC. And that's deeply worrying because you would think that the amount of public pressure on these opposition parties to unite and they still can't unite that's quite a worrying sign for coalition politics in 2024. But a lot of water to go under the bridge before then. Like, share, subscribe. Thanks once again for tuning into SMWX. And we'll see you on the next video. The goal for this channel, 100,000 subscribers by the 2024 election. I think we can do it. And then imagine this platform will have a major say in the digital world of the 2024 election. That's going to be interesting. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for liking. Thank you for subscribing. Keep it locked on SMWX. Comment down below with any of your thoughts. Do you agree? Do you disagree? This is a free place for debate and discussion. And I look forward to seeing you on the next one. I hear you.